Good evening. Welcome to Kerman Baptist Church tonight. Excited to have you here for our service this evening. Let's begin with a song, Great and Mighty is the Lord Our God. Stand with me if you're physically able, and we'll sing it out. Great chorus on the first. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Lift His banner, let the anthem ring. Praises to our mighty King. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. And the second. Sing to Jesus with a song of praise. Sing to Jesus with praise. Sing to Jesus with a song of praise. Sing to Jesus with praise. Fill the heavens with a mighty voice. Uh, may let all rejoice. Sing to Jesus with a song of praise. Sing to Jesus with praise. And then 245, we'll continue on over there. Jesus never fails. And a reminder that in life, people will fail us sometimes, but Jesus never does. He's always faithful and true. Let's get out on the first. Earthly friends may prove untrue, doubts and fears assail. One still loves and cares for you, one who will not fail. Jesus never fails, Jesus never fails. Heaven and earth may pass away, but Jesus never fails. Though the sky be dark and drear, fierce and strong the gale, just remember he is near and he will not fail. Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. Heaven and earth may pass away, but Jesus never fails. And the last. In life's dark and bitter hour, love will still prevail. Trust his everlasting power, Jesus will not fail. Jesus never fails, Jesus never fails. Heaven and earth may pass away. But Jesus never fails. Amen. You can be seated. A couple great truths to live by right there. And we do serve a God who is faithful and true, and he will never fail us. We're so glad to have you here today. And if you're joining us on the video later on, glad to have you participating in that way as well with our service. Let's have a word of prayer and ask God to bless. Um, Sergio, would you like to pray for us this evening, please? You can just pray for me if you can. share just a couple announcements with you things are coming here and um, we do have a week from Wednesday so this Wednesday will be normal connection group with your different group leaders um, but the week following that we're going to have the De Paulis family here with us missionaries from Mexico and I'm excited to by hear to hear from them and it started when uh, brother De Paulis went down to Mexico as a single young man and was uh, down there serving the Lord in a church that was run by a pastor down there and uh, then uh, he met his wife, and they got married and had a kid, and we're kind of working in the church and school there. And so now that his situation has changed a little bit, they're coming back to the United States, seeking some more support, um, and then they'll be headed back to Mexico. And so a lot of great things that God is doing around our world, including in Mexico. And so I'm looking forward to hearing from them about what God is doing there through that church, a pretty established church, pretty large church, um, but yet using him 
and uh, I'm not sure if his plans are to go out from there eventually and start other churches, but we'll learn a lot more about that when he's here, and so looking forward to that family being here with us. And then we do have the ladies' uh, luncheon coming up on August the 3rd, so ladies, if you haven't signed up for that yet, please do, and it looks like we have a good group of ladies coming out. Brenda just took half our share, and there's a sign-up sheet in the back there for that, and I'm sure that they will have a great time there with them. Let's sing one more song. And uh, tonight for our message, we're going to be jumping back into Hebrews again, but kind of turning into the, I'll, I'm going to say last chapter, which is the last three chapters. <laughs> okay, It's not truly the last chapter, but kind of the final section of the book of Hebrews. As the author of Hebrews has been talking about a lot of Old Testament stuff, Jewish stuff, going through all this. But now he's going to get into something that's intensely um, practical for all of us. And that is, how do we live our life by faith? What is the implications, the ramifications of all that? And he's going to say tonight that one of the hallmarks, and I don't want to give it away, but one of the hallmarks of faith is that you live for another country. And he's going to talk about a few of them this evening, and then we're going to kind of summarize. But every one of them lived for heaven instead of for this earth. And that's what this song is about. It's called Make Me a Stranger. And the verse in Hebrews 11 says that these men of faith recognized that they were strangers in this world. And that's what we should do, have the eyes of just saying, hey, this is not my eternal home. I'm kind of a stranger here in this place. People may think I'm a little strange, okay, not because I'm trying to be strange, but they may think I'm a little bit strange. But that's just because I'm living for another country, one that they know nothing about. And so 432 in your hymnal, and it will be on the screen as well. You can remain seated for this one. Make me a stranger. Make me a stranger on earth, dear Savior. Make me a stranger more like Thee. Help me keep my focus on heavenly treasure, and not on earthly things may it be. Lord, lead me onward as a pilgrim bound for heaven never to roam make me a stranger on earth dear savior till i see my heavenly home lord i found myself loving earthly treasures simple pleasures taking your place Nothing can measure to heavenly treasures, hearing well done and seeing your face. Lord, lead me onward as a pilgrim bound for heaven, never to roam. Make me a stranger on earth, dear Savior, till I see heavenly home. Amen. We may sing that one some more over the next couple of weeks. Great song and uh, kind of a one written recently, but a great truth in that song. This time, uh, my family is going to come. We're going to sing a song for you tonight called Behold Our God. And I want you to listen to it. We may add it into our congregational repertoire over time here. So listen as we sing it out. Um, this song, Behold Our God. Thank you. 
Very good. Go and take out your Bibles with me this evening. And we're going to be in Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter number 11. And um, we're actually going to pick up with a little bit of review because it's uh, an important corollary here. So go and turn to Hebrews chapter number 11. And tonight, uh, the service is called, or the message is called, The Picture of Faith. The Picture of Faith. We do have notes. Does anybody need a copy of the notes? There's some back on the welcome table there. If you Oh, I forgot to print that aside again. That back there is for you to write notes vigorously. Okay. <laughs> I do have some bad news. There's a lot of words in tonight's notes. Maybe I can get those for you next week all uh, printed out. I did only give you one half. So uh, you can just write as fast as you can write on the back there. And uh, we will fill those in. But hey, the more important thing is that you get it in your heart, right? So as long as uh, God speaks to you this evening, do that. And as he uh, hits you with some thoughts, write those thoughts down as we go throughout this passage. Man, I thought I was doing so good tonight, too. I missed half the notes. So, Well, let's look at our passage here. And we'll read just the verses that are there in the front through verse number 6, uh, beginning in verse number 39. It says, But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead, still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Let's pray this evening. Lord, I do pray that you would be with us as we go through this passage tonight and that you would really just open to us the treasures of your word, Lord, as we look at faith. And here, Lord, it's um, hard to understate the importance of what we see in chapter 11. As the author of this book, Lord, which we know is the Holy Spirit through the use of another individual, Lord, through the words of another individual, but... um, Lord, as you gave this, and you gave us 10 chapters, Lord, building up to a transition that takes place here as we come into chapter number 11. And I pray, Lord, that we would be people of faith, and in this chapter, you give us some very practical illustrations of that, some very practical examples of that. And so, Lord, I pray that we would take these to heart and that we would change our hearts and lives to be men and women of faith who live out this type of faith in our own lives. In Christ's name I pray, amen. As I'm sure you all know, this uh, really was yesterday we had the tragic attempt of an assassination on former President Donald Trump. And as I was reading through the articles, and you know, you, I don't know if you're like me, just checking every 10 minutes, right? <laughs> to see if there's anything new, you know, like, what's the latest, what's the latest? And at first, what you got was a couple pictures, like maybe from the audience or of the stage or things like that, and maybe a little video. And it was hard to tell what was going on. Okay, you could you could hear some pops in the background, and but you, when I looked at, it, I couldn't even tell where the bullet was coming from. I couldn't tell what was happening. You know, who got hit, or if this is what happened. It was very unclear, and I was trying to just kind of get a, a grasp at it a little bit. But then something came out that really helped me. It was a diagram of the field. Okay, a diagram of this is where the stage was. This is where the people were. This is where the barn was that the shooter was on top of. This is the angle. This is where the people behind him was. And, you know, when you got the diagram, all of a sudden it made it a lot easier to understand. All of a sudden you got a good grasp of, oh, so that's what happened. Okay, you're three minutes into the speech, and these people are here and this, and that's where the Secret Service was. And and suddenly it all kind of made sense. Oh, now I get it because you had a picture of what was going on. Faith can kind of be the same way. It can seem a little bit, like, ethereal, you know, kind of, like, hard to get your hand on. Like, faith, what is faith? And even as it starts to talk here about it, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Okay, well, what is that? Okay, what, what is the substance of things hoped for? 
Um, it's something that's not there, which is substance, you know, and it's the, the evidence of things not seen. Well, if you can't see it, how is there any evidence at all? You know, what, what do you mean the evidence of things not seen? Today we want to look at this because not only does it give us that description, but then it gives us a picture of what faith looks like in the lives of somebody who's living it out. And I think that for us, when you get that picture of it being lived out in somebody's life, that's what actually does really make it clear. That's what actually does really make it understandable to us is to say, oh, so when Noah had faith, then he did this, and now I can see something that felt very intangible. I can see something that felt very much like it was hard to pin down exactly what it was. And so that's going to be kind of our, our uh, what we're looking at tonight as we look at this picture of faith. First, and again, you can try to write this all down or you just take down a couple of thoughts that, ha- <laughs> that you have, okay? Well, however it works best for you. But first, number one, our identification is those who have faith. Our identification is those who have faith. Now, one of the things that we, one of the mistakes we can make when we look at this passage is that we can think of this person of faith because it's attached to these heroes of faith as being something that heroes have, but we don't necessarily have. That's like this, you know, Christianity, you know, extra, Christianity GT, okay, or Christianity Super Drive, or Christianity Superhero, or, you know, something like that. Christianity Extra is is faith. But actually, the author here is not looking at this and saying, here is something that you may someday attain if you really go above and beyond. He's actually really saying that this is the faith that we have the faith that we are because we're in the faith. I want to show you something in verse number 39. And this is why I started it in verse number 39. It says, But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe the saving of the soul. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But here's what's actually going on. In the Greek, the word in 39, believe, to the saving of the soul. Believe in 39. And faith in 11.1 is actually the same word. Okay, now it's translated two different ways. Okay, because they kind of go together. But it's actually the exact same word. And what the author is doing here is he's identifying verse 39. We are not of those who draw back to perdition. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Okay, we're not of those who draw back to perdition. He's not talking about hell, but he's talking to Christians here. and he's, We're not of those who draw back to the destruction of the goodness that we should have done with our lives. But we are of those who believe to the saving of the soul. And again, we we said this is not an eternal damnation or eternal blessing in heaven situation here. He's he's talking to saved people. So he's talking more about the judgment seat of Christ where you suffer loss or you gain reward. And so he's saying we are not of those who draw back to perdition, those who suffer loss, but to those who believe to the saving of the soul those who believe in God and have a reward for how we live our lives. And then he says, now faith, or this belief that we have, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so he's saying here, if you are a Christian who is not backsliding away from the faith, but going forward in the faith, then he, you could say here, we are of those who have faith to the saving of the soul. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. So what does this mean? It means that this is a faith that should be active in our lives. Okay? This, is not, this is not just some far distant goal that we can hope to reach if God somehow blesses our, blesses our life incredibly okay? or gives us the ability to stand up as a hero of the faith. No, this is a faith that is meant to be lived out in each of our lives. We should identify with this life. We should identify with the heroes of Hebrews chapter 11 and say, that is the type of faith that I'm living in my life. Not just this one in a million chance that, oh, maybe God will use me for something amazing. But no, this is, this is the type of faith that I have. I identify with that type of faith. I am one of those who have faith. So it's not meant to be something impossible. It's meant to be something that's normal for us as Christians. Now, number two, not only do we have our identifi- identification with those who have faith, but we see the Bible's elaboration on the substance of faith. Bible's elaboration on the substance of faith. And I'll just go through them kind of real simply here. I will say this about it. 
the Bible is not here trying to give us a dictionary definition of faith. Now, that's kind of hard anyway, <laughs> right? But it's not trying to give us a dif- dictionary definition of faith. Instead, it's telling us what faith looks like when it's active in somebody's life. Okay? It's, it's more the picture than the, the wordy definition. Okay? It's just saying, this is the description of it. This is what it looks like. If you see this, you're seeing faith. So what does it say? Well, first, it says that faith is the substance of things that have not occurred. In verse number one, it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. What is the idea here? It's something that's in the future. It's something that has not happened yet. It has not occurred. And so although it is still in the future, faith is the present um, substantiation of it, that something is going to happen. Something is going to come. And we know that because the saints of God have faith in that. It, It isn't here yet. But it's faith based in the character of God, the promises of God, the confidence that we have in God. And so you say, how, how do you know that that's going to happen? Well, look at the faith that we have. Okay, that's the sign. That's a symbol. That's the acknowledgement that this is what will be. It's the substance of things that have not yet occurred. It's also the proof of things that cannot be seen. Okay, look at verse number one again. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Now, most people would say, well, that's not evidence at all. Okay, <laughs> evidence is something you can see. But if, if nothing's seen, there is no evidence. But spiritually to the Christian, no, the faith that we have is the evidence of something that's unseen. What is the evidence of heaven? It's our, our faith in heaven. Okay, can I show you heaven? Not that your eyes can see. I can show you in the Bible where it tells us about heaven. But that's the words that describe it. So what is the evidence of heaven? Our faith is the evidence of it. It's the confidence that we have is the confidence that we have. Now, that may seem a little bit circular. In a sense, it is. But that is a spiritual foundation, and God loves faith. He wants to see us live by faith. Just like we love to see the faith of perhaps our kids when they're little, okay, or our grandchildren. And they trust us, and we like that, right? <coughs> we can tell them something. Hey, this is going to happen. And you know what? They believe you, okay? You say, it's going to happen? They believe it's going to happen. And then you better make sure it does happen, right? Because otherwise you're going to lose their trust and their faith. And that faith, and, and you come to that kid, how do you know it's going to happen? Well, I believe it's going to happen. Okay, That's the evidence. It's going to happen. I know what my dad said or my grandpa said or my grandma said. And it is going to happen. So faith is the proof of things that cannot be seen. In letter C, it's the key to obtaining a good testimony. It says, number two, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony. We're going to read some of those testimonies in a moment. But central to every testimony that is a good testimony in the Bible is the faith that they had in God. They had an incredible faith in God. And central to every failure in the Bible is a lack of faith. A belief that um, was more about doubt and a belief in the power of you know, sin and Satan than it was in the power of God. And so here we see that the key to obtaining a good testimony is to live by faith. Now, is this going to work on some type of evidence or going before a courtroom or, you know, some type of scientific thing? No, it's not going to work in that. Faith doesn't operate in that way. But God is pleased by our faith. He delights in our faith. And we as Christians are called to live lives of faith. And you cannot separate Christianity from faith. Now, there's a lot of good rational reasons to be a Christian. There's a lot of good things that we can look at and give this evidence and that evidence. But at the end of the day, there is an element of faith that will always be part of our faith. You will never get to a point where you can say, I can prove every every detail. Okay, now, there's a lot of things we can prove. But at the end of the day, you still have to have faith that you can say, well, God's got a reputation and he's done this and we see his power and we see his creation. But you still got to have faith that heaven's coming because right, you can't see heaven. You still got to have faith that there is going to be good that comes from the life that we live because we don't always see that even in our lifetime. So faith is required and is key to obtaining a good testimony. So we have our identification as those who have faith. The Bible's elaboration on the substance of faith. And then number three, we see the Old Testament's exemplifications of faith. Examples from the Old Testament, many of you know them, okay, because we know this passage, right? We know this passage. So let's take a look at them. What are some of these examples in the Old Testament? Letter A is the example of creation. Okay, creation, look at verse number three. 
By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Now, this is a hot topic today. You go tell somebody you believe the world was created by the hand of God rather than through some evolutionary process, and a lot of people will disagree with you, okay, <laughs> at best. Uh, maybe laugh at you a little bit or uh, mock you or just say, what in the world are they thinking? They're in la-la land. They're just believing something by faith. And you know what? We do. Okay, we do. Now, we got lots of scientists. We went to a lot of great universities that can say this is how it could work and things like that. But at the end of the day, nobody saw creation just like nobody saw evolution. Nobody was there. It is built on faith. And that's not a, that's not a negative. That's just a reality. Okay, we are taking the word of God and we trust in it for good reason, but still, when you get back to Genesis chapter number one, you read it by faith. We don't see it. We can't go back and redo it. We can't, we have no way of examining it. We're taking God's eyewitness account for what it is and believing in it by faith. And it says here, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. We look at the evidence, we interpret the evidence through that lens, and it makes sense. But it's still by faith that we understand that. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Okay, we believe that once there was nothing, then there was something. The things that are seen were made of things that was not always visible. And so creation gives us an understanding the unseen. That's done by faith. Okay, that's done by faith. Secondly, let a letter B. Abel. In this story, we see someone being justified for obedience rather than self-wisdom. Okay. Obedience rather than self-wisdom. Look at verse number four. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead, still speaks. Think about the story of Cain and Abel. God came to them and he said, I want you to offer a sacrifice of a lamb. And Abel listened to God and he brought a lamb. Cain listened to his own wisdom. And then Cain started thinking, and he said, you know what? I think that something that grows from the ground is just as good as something that grows in a pen. <laughs> I got all this beautiful food. He wasn't trying to, he wasn't trying to slap God in the face or disrespect God necessarily. Maybe he was, but the Bible doesn't say that. But he trusted his own wisdom instead of having faith in what God had told him to do. And so Abel came with his lamb that God had told him to bring. Cain decided to not trust God, go with his own wisdom, didn't have faith, took the fruit of the ground, probably the best he had, brought it to the Lord as a sacrifice. But it says here that Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Was that because food was necessarily uh, more excellent than meat? Not necessarily. But it's because what God requested was more excellent than what God did not request. Abel had faith not to question God. Cain had faith in his own wisdom and his own understanding. And Abel received the blessing of God. And so it says that by faith we understand, or by faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. He did the right thing. He lived by faith. He took God at his word, obeyed it, lived by faith. He obtained that witness that he was righteous. And even though he died for it, okay, probably not the result he expected. Did his faith give him some immediate blessing? No, it gave him immediate death. But yet it says here, he being dead, still speaks. His testimony rings throughout the ages of someone who trusted in God and was obedient to God and had faith in God. So we see Abel, who has been justified for obedience rather than self-wisdom. Next, Enoch. Now, Enoch's actually a pretty interesting guy. Okay? And I learned a few things about him today. But Enoch, faith to be faithful. Okay, He had the faith to be faithful. Look at verse number five. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now you might say, now what did Enoch do again? <laughs> Abel, you know, he had, he had the lamb and these other guys we're going to look at, you know, Noah built this big boat and, you know, uh, Abraham walked away from his homeland. 
but what did Enoch do again? Okay, <laughs> I, I know he lived a long time, but, you know, what was this great feat that Enoch did? And you even look at the verse, it doesn't really say what he did. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death, and he was found, was not found because God had taken him. So before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And so he had a testimony. So he had a testimony. He was faithful to God. And this wasn't one action that, that you know, highlighted his life by which he received this, this blessing of faith, but he just had a testimony of being faithful to God. Now what's interesting is there's another passage in the Bible that tells us a little bit about that testimony. Turn with me back to Jude. So not back, actually forward couple books here. Hebrews, James. And if you get to Revelation, you know, just a touch too far. But Jude. And let's learn a little bit about Enoch tonight. First, we see that for Enoch, his revelation was limited. Okay? He didn't know a lot about God. Look at Jude chapter, well, there's only one chapter, but verse 14. It says, now Enoch, the seventh from Adam. Okay, so here's Enoch. He's the seventh. Maybe that's generations. Maybe that's people. I'm not exactly sure. He was the seventh from Adam. Um, by the time he died, Adam had died, but pretty much Adam's sons all the way through were, were still alive. Okay? He was very early in this. So he kind of got caught in this weird place where he's probably far enough from Adam. He didn't hear a lot directly. And by the time he got there, a lot of time had passed since God had walked with Adam in the garden. But there also wasn't much new revelation either. Okay? There weren't any books of the Bible written. Everything was just kind of an oral history at this point. There was a lot going on. And so Enoch came into a situation where there was not a lot to go off of. There was not a Bible. There was maybe some stories that he heard about God. Um, maybe an example of Adam doing the right thing, but Adam was like getting pretty late in life at this point. And after Adam, I mean, yeah, there was Seth with some good seed there, but there's also, you know, Cain <laughs> with some not so good seed there. And, and we're going to see in a moment, though, but it just, there wasn't a lot to go on. He was just trying to wing it a little bit and following God. Secondly, we notice in this passage that his generation was wicked. So, yeah, maybe Adam had some stories to tell. Maybe, you know, there were some sons of Seth there that were still kind of trying to do the right thing. But overall, it wasn't a great time to be alive, even seven from Adam. Okay? You know how fast things can go downhill. Okay, right? It doesn't take that long. And here we are a few hundred years into it. A lot can happen. Look at verse number 12. It says, these are spots in your love feasts. Well, they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. He's talking about some wicked apostates here. He says, They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints. So that means that here's Enoch, seventh from Adam. What type of culture is he growing up in? Well, it's the culture of verse number 12 here. Okay. Clouds without water. That's probably about the best you can get out of here, okay? <laughs> Something that looks good from the outside, but it's got nothing on the inside, okay? There might have been some people around who maybe gave lip, lip service to God, but there was no real heart there behind it. They would be the clouds without water. He goes on, you know, carried about by the winds, thinking this one day and that the next day, whatever peer pressure says, that's what they're doing. Late autumn trees without fruit. Okay, Maybe you're hoping for something, but there's nothing there. Okay, A disappointment. And it just keeps going down. Twice dead. I don't know the exact connotation of that, but once dead's bad, twice dead's worse. <laughs> okay, So twice dead. Pulled up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame. Wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness. So here's Enoch, limited revelation of God. Okay, God's not walking in the garden anymore. It's been a lot of years since he has. Living in a wicked culture where the best was hypocrisy and the worst was just out-and-out out wickedness. And so 
So here he is, and yet in the midst of that, his determination was remarkable. Look again at verse number 15. Now, e, or verse number 14. Now, Enoch, the seventh from heaven, or the seventh from Adam, sorry, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against himself, or against him. So here's Enoch in the midst of a wicked generation prophesying against them and saying here, you know, God is going to bring 10,000, what does he say here? Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints. Okay, that, that 10,000 of his saints means 10,000 lights, if you will, or 10,000 of those who are the holy ones. And uh, so here's God coming with 10,000 of these beings. Maybe they're angels at this point. Um, and he's going to bring judgment. And Enoch is just standing up, kind of preaching at him a little bit. Okay? These people twice dead, foaming at the mouth like waves, and Enoch's preaching in faith to them. And so for Enoch, he didn't have to have this one thing that, you know, just was this outstanding symbol of his faith. No, his whole life was a life lived of consistent faithfulness to God. So much so that when God looked and said, Enoch, you've lived hundreds of years, <laughs> okay, whatever it was, in the midst of wicked generation, rebuking them for their sin, being faithful to me, never giving up. When you look at the world around us, it's hard for a Christian to make it 60 years or 70 years, it seems like, without somehow slipping in their relationship with God. And yet here is Enoch, faithful throughout the years. His determination was remarkable. And God here then points out, with a little parenthesis, that the only way to please God is to have faith like Enoch. If you want to please God, it's going to take faith. Look in verse number six. It says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So without faith, it's impossible to please God. You have to have the faith like Enoch to be consistent and faithful in following him. Enoch's faith should be faithful. Let's look at another one here, Noah. And Noah had faith to act on God's word alone. Look at verse number seven. By faith, Noah, and we're blessed with his namesake here with us today. Okay. By faith, Noah, um, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Now, how many of you have ever had a dream before, and it was a great dream, and you woke up and you struggled to remember what it was? You knew it was a good dream. You know, you're like, oh, that was great. What was it that happened? You know, it was so cool. And uh, trying to really kind of rebuild that picture again in your head of what it was and exactly what went on. And like, oh, I got to remember this. Now, can you imagine having a dream and it says here that Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen. I don't know if that was a dream or a vision or what it was. But one time, from what we know, God came to him and warned him and said, Noah, some terrible things are going to be coming going to be a flood. I want you to build a boat. Here's what it needs to look like. And Noah had that, and then he went, and, uh, you know, that moment was gone. The instructions were there. And I bet kind of Noah looked at that and started thinking, you know, this is going to be really hard. <laughs> this is not going to be an easy thing to do. Okay. Um, and he's sitting down, you know, man, it's going to take me three years just to cut the trees down and, you know. Maybe once my boys grow up a little bit, they can help me. And then, you know, I got to start figuring out how to do this. And then I don't even know how to make the blueprint to make this thing float. It's going to take five years of testing, you know, of uh, out on the river to see what, how I can make a boat float. And, uh, you know, he's gonna, he started thinking through this. And, and then he starts doing it, and he finds out it's actually going to be even worse than that because people start laughing at him, okay? And they start mocking him. They start saying, Noah, you're crazy. You know what? No, 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 I'm not crazy. I had a vision. And this guy came to me, and he said to do it just like this because water is going to fall out of the sky, and it's going to be so much water that the whole world is going to be flooded. 
Noah, did you say you weren't crazy? <laughs> you're, trying, you're trying to demonstrate you're not crazy, right? It sounds more like you're trying to demonstrate you are crazy. No, no, I'm not crazy. I had this dream. I had this vision. You know, after those 100 plus years, Noah built and preached and built and preached and built and preached by faith in God. What was that faith? It was the substance of things expected, the evidence of things not seen. In fact, Noah's faith was such strong evidence that God felt justified condemning the rest of the world because of his example. It says here that he was um, divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. What condemned the world? God looked and said, man, if Noah can have faith, what is the excuse of these people he has been preaching to for 120 years? And Noah in one dream got it. <laughs> Noah had one vision and he wrote it down and in spite of it being so hard, he persevered through doing what was right, building that boat, ignoring the criticism, getting his family on there. One dream, he went through all of that to save his wife and his family. And the rest of the people... They were told for 120 years and they couldn't even get their feet on the boat before the rain started. They had all those chances and yet they could not have even that tiny piece of faith to say, I'll just get on the boat for the week. Maybe some people will laugh at me, but it'll be an experience. <laughs> they couldn't even do that. And so Noah's faith stood as a testament that he pleased God and that God responded we're going to wrap there for today, but we see our identification as those who have faith. We should be part of this group. This isn't superhero Christianity. Okay? Now, we may not get our name in the Bible. We may not see the results that some of these other people saw. But if nothing else, we can be Enoch. We can be faithful through our generations in spite of the wickedness that is around us. And so we see the Bible's elaboration. It gives us a picture of what faith is here. It's showing us in the lives of these other people, what did they do? How did they live in response to their faith? And then we see these examples of faith. Let's close in prayer, and then we'll take some time to pray for some requests. Lord, I thank you for the call that you've placed upon us to have faith. It's not always an easy one, Lord. It's a command that many people fail to keep. But I pray, Lord, as we go through this series, that we would have an understanding of how we need to implement faith in our lives. To trust in you, to have faith in you, to reject this world and to embrace the coming world, and to know that our lives are bound up, the, the value of our lives, the, the staying power of our lives, Lord, bound up in eternity, not just what goes on here in this time with us. And I pray that we would be women and men of faith as well. Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's gather around. We'll take some prayer cards.